my name is Brad Dean. I uh, basically am a thorough scholar. I've been studying thorough now for, I guess it's been close to 30 years. I hate to confess that, but it's been about 30 years um, since I first encountered Thoreau. Basically, my area of expertise with Thoreau is his manuscripts. I reconstruct his manuscripts uh, to come up with works that he never lived to publish. So that's basically who I am and what I do. What I'm working on right now is Thoreau's uh, notebooks on the Native Americans. Uh, basically, in uh, about the period of time right after Thoreau left Walden, uh, 1848, he possibly 1849, he began working on a series, on a, on a large project that involved reading everything he could find about the Native American cultures. And he had access to Harvard's incredible library, so he read practically every important uh, history or account of Native Americans, all the expeditions, all the archaeological studies that were being conducted at that time by the Smithsonian Institute, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and and so on. He read um, a little over, he, and he kept notes, by the way, and uh, there are a little over 500 sources. He seems to have been intent on studying, like a scholar would study, uh, indigenous cultures to try to find the embodiment of the, the wild. His famous, uh, Thoreau has this famous, uh, from his essay, Walking, a famous quotation, in wildness is the preservation of the world. Um, civilization entails a certain amount of self-consciousness, and I think Thoreau was trying to get a step away from that with his uh, idea of wildness. I think for Thoreau, the the uh, the red man, as he called him, was the was the wild man in the, in the best sense of the term. So he wanted to see if he could understand the way the Native Americans related to their environment before they learned how to relate to their environment from uh, from the white folks who were coming over. And it's a very interesting experiment and yielded, as I said, to these 12 notebooks. And these notebooks that I'm working on now, I'm editing as 12 manuscript notebooks, about 4,000 manuscript pages, uh, basically his reading notes um, from that project. And you can see a lot of Native American attitude in his writings. Uh, the way that they respected the land, he respected the land in the same way. Uh, and that was from a very early age. Uh, there's even a, a brief journal entry when he's younger, I think in his teens, where he's writing in fake Indian language, you know, me love him type stuff. But he's not doing that because he's being a racist. He's doing that because he really admires the Native American spirit and the Native American mind. And that was the way it was for his entire life. The evidence of Thoreau's early interest in Native Americans pretty much is that. It's a very stereotypical, romantic sort of view. It's the Hiawatha syndrome, you know, uh, me tanto, that sort of thing. It's not very sophisticated. It's what you would pretty much expect a young man in uh, earlier, mid-19th century America to have kind of an unsophisticated attitude toward Native Americans or sort of romantic attitude toward Native Americans. What you see throughout his life is a much, much more increasingly sophisticated uh, interest. His interest towards the end of his life is very, very... Uh, um, even beyond scholarly. Um, he wants to know, he's adamant about getting his mind around what Native Americans are really like in Native American culture, not the way they actually were, well, in addition to the way they actually were in mid-19th century America, but also anti-Columbian, before Columbus discovered the New World. Now, if you think about it, in a sense, it's kind of impossible to do that, of course, because uh, you have to rely on what, there's oral traditions, I suppose, in the Native American cultures. There's uh, archaeological digs. Uh, there are uh, the early accounts, and for Thoreau, Thoreau's purposes, the most important source were the early explorers' accounts of the discovery of the New World, Cabot, up at Nova, was it Nova Scotia? North of Nova Scotia. Anyway, was it, where? Newfoundland. Newfoundland. Um, and so on. So Thoreau read Smith and all the early explorers, uh, did quite a bit of work in Canadian, very early Canadian history. Uh, if you've read Cape Cod, you know he did a, he read all the explore and presented his account in Cape Cod of the early ex earliest explorations in uh, New England. And what he was again trying to do with the Native Americans was to get his mind around the way they were before the Europeans. I don't know if you want to say corrupted them, but anyway, changed them. Uh, it is something that we need to learn 
as an American people as we expand westward. It is something we need to learn as a modern civilization that the uh, native civilizations that were here before us are worth studying and worth learning from. There is a great love that exists from the Creator who created the Father and the Son, Father, the Son, the Mother Earth, and that is generated and shown to us. This is the love that the Creator has for all people and all things and all life in the universe. From a very early age, uh, Henry Thoreau was uh, enamored with the Native Americans uh, of New England. Um, from a very early age, he was collecting arrowheads and spear points. Uh, he seemed to have a knack for finding those sort of artifacts all over Concord. In fact, he said the soil of Concord is arrowheadiferous because it was so easy for him to find arrowheads. Um, natives lived in this area for almost 10,000 years. As much as sportsmen go in pursuit of ducks and gunners of musquash and scholars of rare books and travelers of adventures and poets of ideas and all men of money, I go in search of arrowheads when the proper season comes round again. Journal, March 28th, 1859. So it was very easy for him to find those sort of artifacts in the soil of Concord because they were all farmers here when Thoreau was here. So they're always turning up the dirt and always turning up arrowheads and old sites of campfires and lodges and stuff like that. The larger pestles and axes may, perchance, grow scarce and be broken, but the arrowhead shall perhaps never cease to wing its way through the ages to eternity. It was originally winged for but a short flight, but it still, to my mind's eye, wings its way through the ages, bearing a message from the hand that shot it. They are not fossil bones, but, as it were, fossil thoughts, forever reminding me of the mind that shaped them. I would fain know that I am treading in the tracks of human game, that I am on the trail of mind, and these little reminders never fail to set me right. Journal, March 28th, 1859. There is scarcely a square rod of sand exposed in this neighborhood, but you may find on it the stone arrowheads of an extinct race. Far back as that time seems when men went armed with bows and pointed stones here, yet so numerous are the signs of it. The finer particles of sand are blown away, and the arrow points remain. The race is as clean gone from here as this sand is clean swept by the wind. Such are our antiquities. These were our predecessors. Why then make so great ado about the Roman and the Greek, and neglect the Indian? We need not wander off with boys in our imaginations to Juan Fernandez to wonder at footprints in the sand there. Here is a print, still more significant at our doors, the print of a race that has preceded us, and this, the little symbol that nature has transmitted to us. Yes, this arrow-headed character is probably more ancient than any other, and to my mind it has not been deciphered. Just one, uh, one thought, um, as you were saying, he said his church was, uh, was out there. Uh, I, had, I had given a similar uh, uh, quotation to a, to a priest inside of a church one day I was talking to him on Indian Island and uh, I was explaining how uh, how very sad it was inside that church and uh, and I said well and it's, it's it's very but it's very nice I said when uh, when you have your services on Sunday it's it's really really good because the people are very very uh, very uh, reverent uh, and uh, and they feel from their spirit. You can feel the energy in there, the spirit of those people that knows this. And then you give your uh, you give your uh, sermon. And said, and then uh, after the service is all over, everybody goes out the door, and uh, it's done till the next week when they come back again the next Sunday. I said, but for for me, when I walk out that door, I said. Um, I, I leave this church, but I said, my church is right there, outside of that door. When I see the sun, when I see the clouds, when I feel the wind and the air, and uh, I said, that was my church. <laughs>